Yeah, thank you very much. So it's maybe a bit of an unusual talk with four uh, authors, three of them have made it here on stage. My job is very simple. I'm just here to introduce everyone who did the work. So it originates from my research group at the Technical University in Regensburg. Uh, it's also partly related to work done at Siemens Corporate Research. Many of you may know we have a, a dedicated embedded Linux team there. Most of the work was done by Ralf Ramsauer as part of his PhD thesis in Regensburg, Lukas Pulvan. Uh, who works for a car manufacturing company but is not representing this car manufacturing company but is here as a hobbyist. I uh, will explain you some of the results that we've got. But uh, what we are mostly here for is to hear your opinion on how uh, the community, how you can use our results to improve the Linux kernel development process, uh, to quantify the kernel development process, a topic that has gained um, more and more attention and traction in the last couple of years, especially for um, safety certifications of Linux systems. But with that, let me hand over to Lucas. Yeah, so um, thanks for the introduction. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here in Lisbon, actually because of two reasons. Reason number one, I've actually married less than a week ago here in Lisbon. Um, and my wife, my newlywed wife, allowed me to come to this conference and <laughs> shift the honeymoon to an actually different date. So I'm happy to be here. Second reason, being here actually talking to this audience here um, because it's actually the best audience to um, understand and actually improve the process um, based on the results that we have. Okay, so the list is our, the list is our process. That's actually the answer. That's the answer to the question, how does Linux kernel development work? And if you ask around, the short answer is, well, the list is our process. Um, but we want to understand this a little bit more. We want to understand this in more detail. And this means actually formalizing and assessing the Linux kernel development process. So before you're afraid, formalizing sounds like a big word. You're going to see later on. It's not that complicated. There are actually two motivations for that. Um, there's one motivation that comes from the outside, so outside of the Linux kernel community. And then there is further motivation that's actually from the inside of the Linux kernel community. We're going to look into this in a bit detail. So from the outside perspective, there are more or less two stakeholders. Uh, the first one being academic research, showing that they can apply statistical methods, so big data methods, machine learning methods, um, on software engineering. And they can show how to improve the process. The Linux kernel is their prime example for the evaluation to show that the methods work. So that's the, um, Ralf Ramsauer and Wolfgang Maurer being the representatives of that, that group. Um, there's a second group, the commercial users, are more or less a representative of that, where um, commercial users are interested in using Linux, the Linux kernel, but they're not involved in the development and they want to know that the Linux kernel development is sound, is good. Um, and especially important, um, this is in, uh, let's call them um, certification requirements. So you can see that in regulated environments, so security uh, related systems or safety related systems. And these standards say very extensively um, actually two things. First of all, you must be able to describe your process. And secondly, you have to show evidences that, that what you describe is actually that what you execute. And then we come to the interest um, within the Linux kernel community. And there is actually two prime examples that we can see in the recent um, time. There is the, art, uh, the presentation from Dan Williams towards the Linux kernel maintainer handbook from last year. And there's another um, thread or email discussion, um, an LWN article, where there was the interest to um, create change IDs for kernel patches. So you might have followed that discussion as well. So what did uh, Dan Williams present last year? So here's just a copy of one slide um, as a takeaway from his suggestion. And he asked for 
creating subsystem profiles for the different um, subsystems. And he more or less asked for create, obtaining all this data um, for the different subsystems. And of course, now the question comes up, why do we have to ask actually 100 of maintainers to provide this information? Couldn't we just get this information by observation if that information is publicly available anyway? Of course, there's value to both. Um, and we're going to consider, is it possible to actually get this information by observation? So that's the motivation. Um, now, the first step to do that is that we have to more or less formalize the development process. And this is already the formal model that we're going to use. It's quite simple. The patch is created. It's submitted. The patch is on the mailing list. It's discussed. And then it continues usually with the task to rework the patch in some way. This happens um, iteratively n times until it some, at some point reaches a point that there's no further discussion and the patch from the mailing list is integrated into one Git repository, eventually Linux Git repository. Uh, the important thing here to note is that, of course, everything below this dotted line is publicly uh, visible, but this relationship is somehow lost through the pri private activities. And what is now the task that um, has to be determined to actually recreate this, to compute this trace, is to determine the patch evolution relation that is publicly visible. And with that now seemingly simple task, um, we kind of handed this off to academia and they tried to solve this. And that's the task that Ralph will go into in detail. So, um, first of all, it's turn on, yeah. it's turn on. Uh, no. We would need the other. Right. Hello? Yes, I do speak in the microphone. Okay, yeah, now it's works. working. Okay. Um, so first of all, let's recall how the Linux kernel development process uh, works. I guess you, all of you uh, probably know that. But um, so on the one side, we have the mails on mailing lists that developers send to the mailing lists. Uh, and on the other side, there is the Git repository where we have all the commits. Um, so mail on a mailing list is identified by a message ID. And of course, a commit in the repository is identified by uh, a unique I, a commit hash. During the development, there may be more than one patch um, because there is the revision one, revision two, revision three of a patch, so it's an iterative process. And there may even be, for the same patch, there may even be more than one commit hash in a repository as, uh, for example, different maintainers may pick up um, the same patch and apply it to their threes, uh, trees and later when the trees got merged, then you have the same patch um, occurring twice in uh, the repository. The problem that we are now facing is that the connection between emails and the connection between the email and the commit hash um, is lost during this manual um, pickup process of the patch. So in the repository, we actually only have um, the result of the development process that happened before on the mailing list. So some authors may, uh, uh, some maintainers may add uh, the link tags um, to their commits um, that points to the last message uh, in a series, but all the other steps um, are lost during um, the process. So somehow, uh, for any analysis that we would like to do, we need um, to get this mapping of, um, of different mails to commit hashes, and we have a tool for that. Um, our tool is called PASTA, the patch stack analysis, and initially it was designed to detect uh, similar patches that or apply to different branches in a repository. Uh, we use that tool to, for example, quantify uh, mainlining efforts of uh, large out of three developments such as the preempt RT uh, patch stack. So we wanted to know how many patches um, of this patch stack are being uh, mainlined over time. And we um, added support for mailing lists to this tool. 
because from a structural point of view, a mail on the mailing list is nothing else than um, a commit in a repository. So what do similar patches actually look like? So here I have an example of, uh, of two similar patches. On the left side, you can see um, a patch that first occurred on uh, the preempt RT patch. This could also be an email on the mailing list. And on the right side, you can see um, the commit as it appeared upstream. So from first point of view, um, these patches might look pretty dissimilar. They have a completely different uh, commit message. Um, also, the diff looks quite dissimilar, but if we have a closer look at um, the diff, we can see that both patches patch the, patch the same file. Inside this file, they patch uh, the same hunk. They remove the same line. And if we look at the inserted lines, then we can see that um, from a functional point of view, they int introduce the same change. And they pretty much use the same keywords. So if we group um, those insert insertions by keywords, then uh, we can see a, see a quite huge overlap. And then we can use simple leverage sign string, distance, uh, string distances for, for pairwise comparison of those keywords and see that uh, this patch, for instance, has a diff similarity of 87.5%. And this is how we can um, map or track similar patches. Now, if we would like to apply this technique to mailing lists, we would have to, com uh, to compare any patch on a mailing list to all commits in the repository or against all other emails uh, on the mailing list, which would lead to a combinatorial explosion, of course. So we have some pre-evaluation techniques to reduce um, the overall search space. And in the, um, in the left graph, the green dots are patches on mailing lists, the orange dots are commits in the repositories, and the edges between those nodes are weighted by the similarity um, of the patches. The solid lines are patches where the similarity exceeds a certain threshold, and the dashed lines are similarities uh, that are below a certain threshold. And if we remove the dashed lines, we get partitions of similar patches. And this is nothing else than a clustering. So this, from a machine learning perspective, this is nothing else than a clustering problem. And we can apply all the techniques that uh, uh, come from that field. So I, I don't want to fall into details. Um, if you are interested in how this technique um, works in detail, you can have a look at um, two of our papers. Everything is written down there. So the next step is data acquisition. Where do we get uh, our data from? So at the beginning, there was gmain.org. <laughs> all, all, archive, all archives over almost all lists uh, could be found there, but um, yeah, they shut down a few years ago. So those archives aren't available any longer. It was pretty nice because they used the NNTP protocol. It was pretty simple to uh, retrieve all those archives. Now, uh, there are the lore.kernel.org um, public inboxes. There, some lists are archived, not all lists are archived, um, but those lists contain prehistoric data, so you can find patches from 1990 something um, on that list. Eventually, we created our own mailing list archive um, that covers about 200 mailing lists that are mentioned in the maintainer's file of the Linux kernel, and you can find those lists also as public inboxes here um, under that link. So for our analysis that we are, um, that we are doing in, um, in this talk, we only um, consider the archives on kernel.org as they reach long in the past. So the data is there, let's get started. Turns out that uh, working on mails is not that easy. Headers say that uh, the email is encoded in UTF-8, in UTF but in fact the mail is encoded in ISO 8859, but only the half of the mail is encoded uh, in that way, so you can find all fancy stuff there. So uh, we somehow had, first of all, to normalize uh, all these data. You can, for instance, find headers like this. Uh, this is a message ID. It begins pretty okay, but it ends with a... Uh, with the time, uh, with the date from the future. Uh, you can find other headers like this. Uh, so it looks like the author is not sure in which 
time zone he or she currently is, you can find mills like this. So every uh, date parser will refuse to parse this kind of email. So maybe that's the reason, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So the data that we analyze uh, reaches from 2011 to um, 2018. We analyze about three million emails and uh, try to map those emails against the repository. We take the last 2.6 release of the Linux kernel, compare it uh, up to Linux's uh, master tree. And we take all lists that we can find on lore.kernel.org. Those are those lists, especially uh, this includes uh, lists with high patch or high mail frequency, such as uh, Linux ARM kernel, the Linux kernel mailing list, Linux Next, NetDev. So those are the lists with many patches per day. So we have three million mails, but only about one third of all emails on those lists contain actual patches. So we are only interested in the green part. But even if you have a closer look at the green part, we can see that um, we can divide those one million patches to uh, patches that actually patch Linux and other patches, so patches that patch user space tools. If you look at all 200 mailing lists of the Linux kernel, we can see that about 14% of, pat of patches on all lists do not affect Linux at all. So 14% of all patches are uh, user, spa user space tool patches. Across those Linux kernel patches, um, we have to filter for actual patches. So we are not interested in stable review patches, in git pull requests, in mails that are being sent from bots. There are many bots that send patches or that include patches. So we have to filter for actual patches and even for actual patches that are not from any uh, automated uh, systems. We are only interested in those patches that are the root of a thread, so that are the initial patch of a thread and not patches that are uh, inside responses to a thread. So, and then there remain only about 800,000 um, patches. And these are the patches that we um, consider in our analysis that Lucas is going to present in the next part of the talk. So now we have, so now we have the raw data and um, we're gonna do data aggregation, right? So um, we wanna look at certain defined Properties. So we're going to give a definition for a property and then extract that um, property from the raw data. The next step would then be to interpret this behavior and to say, um, what does that actually mean? Um, what can we observe um, in, in, in this data? And the last step, of course, would be to, to judge if this is good behavior or if this is actually considered bad behavior, if this is... Uh, good for the community, if this is good for the product, um, or if this is actually something bad um, for the community, bad for the product. And as it happens, the, the uncertainty increases as you go down these levels, right, from data analytics. And especially, um, it, there's an increasing need that you actually have kernel community knowledge um, when you go down um, into these deeper levels. And as we are outsiders, we're really just focusing on the first two steps. We're trying to extract uh, reasonable um, properties out of the raw data, and we're trying to show how this can be interpreted, how, which kind of behaviors we observe. We're not, intended, we're not trying and we're not intending to actually judge this behavior. This is something that probably the community as a whole can do and can discuss, but um, on a, on a statistical level, this is very difficult to actually um, provide sound reasons. That's probably always interweaved with some expert judgment, and we're not the experts in, in this community. So we're going to look at one um, first property. Um, if you recall the formal model that um, I described, we said, well, it's kind of passing through the mailing list until it ends on the um, in the Git repository. And of course the question is, does every patch go through this um, trace or are there actually other um, side channels? First side channel you could think of is, well, actually a patch is somehow sent to the mailing list, but it eventually just gets stuck there, right? Um, nobody responds, 
Um, there's no further action from the author. Um, and this is what we call ignored. Right? That's the formal definition that I'm giving here. We call a patch ignored. If the thread of the patch has no responses from persons other than the author, um, the patch was not accepted upstream, so it's not in the Git repository. And actually, all related patches were ignored as well. Right? We call that we have a um, kind of a relationship that we're checking. And this is a recursive definition, but this is nothing that we have to be afraid of. It's well defined. Logically, we're talking about a finite set, and um, this is, uh, you can actually come to a, a consistent definition of that. So, also when we're using the word ignored, it has some kind of connotation when we talk about it in natural language. Kind of ignore that for this word now, right? Um, it's just a property that we're calling that way. It could be good, it could be bad, we actually don't know anything about this, right? It's just a definition. And now we're interested in specific characteristics of this ignored patches. And that's actually three questions that we're going to answer in this, or the three questions that we're first going to raise and hopefully going to answer um, in this talk. The first question is, um, has, the, has the number and the rate of ignored patches changed over the last seven years, from 2011 to 2018? Right? The second is, um, does this property of ignored patches depend on the development cycle? Does it make a difference if I send something at RC4, or does it make a difference if I send something at RC8, or at some other point in time? And the third question is, does this ignored, um, this characteristics of ignored patches, is that related to the authors that send that? Right? Um, so maybe a short round into the, into the audience, what are the guesses? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay, so what, yes? Yes for the last one. Yes for the last one, okay. How about over time? What did change? More, less? Uh, more over time. More over time. Okay. Let's look at the data, right? I mean, this is, this is, you're doing educated guessing and we're trying to gonna either prove or disprove your statements now with the data that we can see. So if we look at the numbers, um, lauricornell.org, 2011 to 2018, this property is around 2.5%. You can say this is a large number, you can say this is a low, low number. I actually don't care, right? It's, it's the number. Um, you can see 2011, it was uh, roughly 3.9, and 2018 is 1.6. If we look at all the mailing lists that we're collecting at the moment, we're at 3.3, but Keep in mind, right, we're talking about the recent development, actually deciding if something is already accepted upstream or not is kind of difficult to judge given we started in May. So let's look at this data in more detail. Um, so you see here the um, absolute number of patches. Um, in red, you see the ignored patches, and in blue, you see the total number of patches sent on the mailing lists. And as you can see, um, the number of total patches is increasing. That's not a surprise. Um, we know that. Um, but actually, in fact, the number of ignored patches is slightly decreasing um, over time. Um, now we can look into the data. Yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, there's quite a few bots on the list now that sort of, you know, yep. replies say this doesn't compile. Do you count that as a response or would it still be ignored if you got a reply from a bot? Um, we would consider that a response. Okay. Yes. So um, what we can see if we look at this in detail, we can look at the, maybe the first easy thing that we can see is if you look at the blue line, you see these kind of spikes going down. Statistically, it's kind of a, regularly, yearly happening event. That what a statistician would call it. The non-statistician would just call it Christmas break, right? That's what's <laughs> happening. Um, 
The other thing that you can see on the rot, red plot is that there is a spike around mid of 2016, um, quite um, impressive one there. And we looked into that in, in detail, and it's actually a combination of a technical issue and a human error that happened at that point that led to this um, huge sp um, spike of ignored patches. After we had a look at that, we said, okay, it might just mess up further analytics that we're doing, so we're just um, um, ignore, um, moving, ignoring that week. Yes? What kind of human error? We're not saying we're, we're not saying anything. So we're not going to, yes, we're not going to say who it was. We're not going to say um, <laughs> what kind of error it was. It was just someone who didn't understand the process properly at that point. You may want to look into process yeah. So if you're long enough in the development, you know the, you know the, the what happened in that week. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to look into this in more detail. Um, so here are the number of ignored patches, and we can actually see if we put a general model on this, we see that it's fluctuating a little bit, but generally doing a linear regression on this is is sound and stable because there are not too many, um, uh, yeah. Uh, too much freedom actually in this in this uh, curve. Um, if we now look into the ratio, right, comparing um, the percentage of ignored patches, we do see that it's not just a slight decrease; it's actually a significant decrease, comparing um, to the fact that um, the number of patches is significantly increasing. So we do see that it's actually um, getting lower from three percent to around two percent for the last six years. Um, the second thing that we could look into is, okay, how is this related to the release candidate, to the, uh, to the development stage, right? Um, what if the patch is sent in the, in the merge window? What happens if it's sent at a certain point during a certain release candidate? Um, the graphics here is a bit complicated because we're actually aggregating over 40 release cycles, um, and every one of them um, pro is actually a distribution of data. But what you can see from this data is for the merge window, it is slightly higher, um, um, the likelihood that you would actually get ignored. And for uh, between uh, release candidate one till the final release, it's actually quite stable or actually has a very similar rate. Um, a third, yep. So I, yep. I guess the question I have with respect to why we're checking ignored patches is um, what does that do for the confidence of the patches that are in the kernel? Because an ignored patch is by definition not in the kernel. Yes, uh, yes. It tells, us, it tells us something about the process. Um, if, if everyone is following the process or the community as a large is following the process um, of giving feedback until it is in the kernel. And that's something that, that you need because that's the core essence of the process. And that is actually the question we have for you guys in the discussion. What do these numbers tell us? Is that good? Is that bad? So we don't have we don't any, know, right? any interpretation of that. We just have the data. Yeah. Okay. But so, um, so maybe that's something for the discussion later on. Yes. Um, so what we also looked at is um, we're now looking at uh, is this related to the developer, right? So we're looking at the number of ignored patches by author. And every dot represents one person in the kernel development or one identity in the kernel development. Um, and as you can see, um, there's quite a lot of people involved. The most important thing that we want to really want to point out is that for most people, you never reach um, more than 50 ignored patches over your kernel development um, career. Right? Um, only very, very few have more than 100 ignored patches. And um, as you can also see, 
yes, at the beginning, the, the curve is a bit kind of steeper. And afterwards, it's kind of in this wavy, getting constant shape. But you shouldn't kind of, you shouldn't interpret too much into the, these details because that's just uh, statistics based on the, on the data that we have here. Um, but important is most people are not ignored. Most people are actually um, facing that problem uh, a constant number of times and then it actually stops, independent of how long you're in the kernel community. So um, now back to another question. Is that actually the only way to get your um, commit into the repository? Do I have to go through the mailing list and is it then integrated? And that's, um, or is there actually a side channel? And that's what we call a off-list patch, right? So an off-list patch is a patch that has been included into Linux Git repository, but has actually never been sent to any public mailing list. That requires that you have access to all public mailing lists where patches are sent to and um, that you kind of follow them. So that's why we're kind of following these, these uh, mailing lists more extensively lately. Now, this is very early work and we actually used the heuristics to identify 80 commits out of one stabilization phase from um, 5.1 RC1 to 5.1. It's about 1,800 commits. Um, then we had to go through these 80 commits manually because it's prone to error and it's, um, it's of course, um, prone to the fact that we don't know if we actually have all mailing lists. In the end, we did this, went through 60 commits, and could actually identify 24 off-list commits. Now, we can't derive much knowledge from seeing 24 um, off-list commits, so there's not any statistics that we're creating there. I can just say the kind of obvious things is um, reverting patches is often discussed on the mailing list. Of course, the reverting patch itself might not end on the mailing list. Um, another other obvious thing is that um, we found out by the numbers just that actually very few patches from maintainers are actually sent off list. Um, for most maintainers, they are somehow on the list. Um, the more less obvious things that we found out is that some of those off list patches seem to be security related if you can follow up on them. And also the patches that are off list they're not uh, evenly distributed over all maintainers, but they're actually uh, specific to some subsystem maintainers. So um, let's look at one of those examples. So here's one of those examples that we found um, as an off-list patch um, from, from Greg. TTY, Mark Siemens, R3964, line discipline is broken, um, was um, included in the, um, I think in the 5.0, kernel, if I'm not mistaken, and um, you look on the mailing list and you try to find it. If you Google now for it, you're going to find that there's some backports to some other trees, um, but you're not going to find some in, in, in initial discussion on, on this patch. And it does say some, some things down there, like many thanks to Jan and Linus for pointing out the initial problems. So there must be some kind of secret channel going on um, <laughs> that, that we're not aware of, right? Um, yeah. If you want to know the details on that, I guess you have to ask the authors um, personally. Yes, and with that, um, we'll conclude. Yeah, so thanks for the um, interest so far. Just to reiterate what we, what we said is we presented some examples, but these examples for our analysis are not what's really the interesting point or the interesting um, thing in our, from our point of view. It's more now that we do have mechanisms available that can basically reconstruct many properties that are only implicitly or have only been implicitly available in the Linux kernel development process. And that of course raises uh, the question, especially considering the uh, K-Summit um, preparation discussion about um, tracking the uh, kernel development process, what you as kernel development community would find interesting uh, questions to answer given this kind of magic mechanism 
that can provide such answers. What we've learned um, in the last couple of years doing this research is that the typical gut feeling, the typical intuition from developers about kernel development is um, usually not quite accurate, as you have also seen uh, when you asked the questions during the talk and gave data-driven answers. So, um, yeah, let's start the discussion with Given that these mechanisms are available, what, is, what are questions that we could help you answer them with, that we could provide benefits to the kernel development community? So I'll make the observation that the old management mantra of you get what you measure um, is very often true. Uh, one of the ways in which Linux Next has actually you know, captures the vast majority of patches before uh, the merge window um, is because Stephen Rothwell publishes statistics of how many patches are in Linux Next um, before the final release is put out and then at the end of the merge window, how many patches were not in Linux Next, bypassed Linux Next, and who were the top 10 subsystem maintainers who were responsible for that. Um, so that there was sort of just, you know, no judgment was made, but people saw that and they, you know, adjusted their behavior accordingly and now the vast majority of patches go through Linux Next. So one observation I would make is that if we wanted to do something similar, assuming we all believe that all, you know, mailing list review good would be a regular mechanism by which we could do something similar where at the close of each merge window, what percentage of patches uh, actually were, uh, actually went through the mailing list. And um, Sasha recently made a comment about how a patch that landed in, I think, RC7 or RC6 had some nasty effects and obviously didn't get enough testing. Um, and again, if we were to measure how many patches went through the uh, mailing list process versus those that didn't, and at what time did they enter the process, uh, it would probably start to put pressure on the community without necessarily having to call anyone out. So. Okay, thanks, that's a thing surely to consider. Any comments from you guys? No. Any more ideas? Wishes? Wait, so here, Darren. Um, I'd be curious to know if you've ha if you have any numbers on the number of malformed patches submitted to the mailing lists. So tooling errors that are common in terms of complying with the process. So I don't have these data right now, but I could calculate them. For example, simply by by looking at patches that. Are, or by simply looking at emails that were not detected as patches, but contain, for instance, patch in their subject. Mm -hmm. This would probably be malformed uh, patches, yes. Be there and there will be quite some. This <laughs> <laughs> is always going on for whatever reason. Um, so this is sort of related. Uh, your diff or patch similarity thing, you could also apply that to the stable trees. Um, and then you could say this mail became this commit upstream and this commit in all the stable trees. And that would be really, really helpful for me uh, and probably some other people. that Ralph is trying to say is also, right, we're using a heuristics, right? So um, I would prefer to, of course, rely on data that has actually been added in the process. And if that happens with, with Greg's script, right, saying, okay, that was the upstream commit, and that's, that's the hash, then I would try to rely on that data or not. Yeah. But, so as a fallback, you can always use our methods, yes. I'd be much interested in the latency, like how, how long does it take 
someone submits a patch to get a first reaction, if there is a reaction. So um, do people need to wait like one week or one month or whatever? And how that latency develops over time? I would be interested in that. So uh, do you think, have you tried measure also the number of iteration a patch takes to get in and how that change differ between different subsystems and also measuring how many people is involved in the review process depending on the different subsystems? Do you think it's possible with your system to? So, so the uh, two questions that you raised, um, that has been actually very well researched outside the Linux kernel community. So there's uh, quite some academic work that I can point you to, but uh, we could also extract these facts from, from our database. Yeah, in, in a similar vein, I'd be curious to see uh, what the acceptance uh, percentage was. Like, these patches got replied to, so they weren't ignored, but they never made it into the Git tree. So like, how, what is the frequency of things actually landing, which again has been studied, but this you look like you have a larger, more complete data set. I actually think, yeah, I think we actually uh, looked into that as well, but we did, didn't include that in the presentation. Um, again, right, you have to ha look at the, at the details so they're not just from a first plot just come to a certain conclusion. Um, but yes, we're, um, yeah, we're interested in that as well. And uh, we will follow up with the answers to these questions probably in the slide deck or in uh, some other way. Yeah, I would imagine that one really tricky thing is you're using patch similarity, um, but very often what can happen is that uh, a request is made to uh, accomplish the same goal of the patch, but in a very different way. And so therefore the patch similarity is very, very different and so just simply being able to chain between version two and version three of a patch set in the absence of metadata to make it obvious um, is probably gonna be challenging for a heuristic uh, tool. Uh, yeah, it is. That's uh, actually why this, this work is at the forefront of uh, academic software engineering research. It was a, um, a result that actually surprised us quite a lot that doing these seemingly simple textual comparisons without having um, uh, any abstract syntax tree or whatnot it does work really well. But it turns out, um, if, you, if you look into the um, proper paper, that the quality of the clustering we can, can come up with is quite high. Um, maybe Ralf, who has suffered quite a lot to do a manual evaluation, wants to comment on that? Yeah, so, for most, so for most cases it works, but of course there are some limitations uh, and it will be pretty hard to overcome these limitations. And even for a human, it is hard to identify these kind of patches, so. Well, we, we did a very large scale um, manual evaluation, Ralph looking at patches and emails and patches and emails and patches and emails, uh, so that we had some ground truths that we could compare and optimize our method against. And it, it works fairly well. Yes. So one of the things that has been under discussion, which you may or may not be aware, is uh, there has been a discussion about trying to find automatic ways of matching, uh, actually inserting message IDs um, into commit messages. That's actually relatively easy. Uh, the thing for which I don't believe there's been any consensus is what is the best way to insert metadata so that in fact you can match um, different versions of a patch set um, through you know, version one to in some cases version 50 of a patch series. Um, how do you actually sort of chain the revision history? And I don't know, uh, people are experimenting with different mechanisms, but it may be that in the future you will have some metadata to assist in your uh, work and that may allow you to do much more richer much more interesting sort of uh, answers to some of the questions uh, people have posed. Yeah. 
So we are aware of this discussion, and of course it would be great to have such a mechanism installed in the kernel development process, but then uh, it's not just the Linux kernel that we are interested in, so a typical system, uh, you may be aware of that or not, <laughs> consists of more than the Linux kernel, and we also need to take these components into account and are changing the behavior of the Linux kernel community that's larger than 50 people is also a challenging thing as the past has shown. So there will be a need for such intermediate solutions, I guess. So one more question, I guess. Yeah. Not so much a question as a suggestion. So um, when uh, we started doing link tags, or we originally was like uh, message ID tags, which then transmogrified into link tags that are really just the same information, just automated. So you click on them, you get to you get to see them. But we could do that with um, right now they're done as an automatic, you know, as an automatic commit. But you can um, you can do that with patch revisions too, and have backlinks to the previous versions. And that way, you could ac you actually would get an entire chain of patch revisions when you know you that you can just click through, and it would also solve some of your problems. Uh, other comment is that the one day people um, uh, or zero day people uh, testing people have done some of this work as well, that you may be able to um, share some of the effort. Okay, so uh, I think we already ran out of time, uh, but we all will be, so thank you, thank you very much for this already very, very helpful input that we will consider in future work and we'll all be around if you have more uh, ideas, questions, things to tell us. Thank you very much again.